so uh, good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to a, a live stream from the San Diego Astronomy Association. Um, the reason I am chuckling here is because we literally were having technical problems until 30 seconds ago. So <laughs> the confidence in us getting through this stream without too many problems mm -hmm. here is uh is going to be interesting but we'll we'll see what we can do um so uh my name is gary hawkins um the presentation or the live stream is we're going to be looking at the constellation of orion uh which is a very famous constellation that um, most people uh, are familiar with and uh, we're going to be looking at that through the eyes of Robert Burnham, who uh, uh, wrote a very famous, uh, well, actually, it's a set of three books that we're going to talk about in a few moments. And uh, we're going to look at it through his eyes and use some of his comments. But before we do all of that, um, I am going to hopefully um, allow my co-presenter, to introduce himself. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's been quite a uh, an evening making sure stuff comes together here at the last minute. Um, I, I am the uh, outreach coordinator for the Astronomy Association here in San Diego. A little explanation, uh, you know, following the rules for the uh, response to the COVID problem, things have been shut down. Um, we had uh, hoped to do this event and a couple others out at the Oak Oasis County Park in the Lakeside area east of San Diego. And uh, we did one event there that was wonderful, very easy and, and a great setup, a nice place to go. And the park is very, very cooperative. But after the latest changes in the rules regarding the response to uh, COVID, uh, the park uh, advised us that they would not be able to host uh, these events uh, for the time being. So at the last minute, um, we, Gary and I, have attempted to throw together this program uh, from our homes, and uh, there's been a lot of technical issues. Uh, Gary, are you still there? Are you live? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, unfortunately, I forgot uh, when uh, I swapped over to the introduction there to uh, transition do the transition in obs so everybody was still looking at the introduction slide as opposed to um our oh. our our faces but i've solved that problem <laughs> and um just to give you an idea of um how um difficult this is this evening um normally we operate at one site we're together next to each other or at least socially distanced and all the computer equipment and everything is in one place. Um, that is not the case this evening. Uh, Dave is actually at his home in uh, La Mesa, Dave? Yes. Yeah, so. Dave is at his home in La Mesa. I'm actually at my home in Scripps Ranch. Um, Dave is Skype calling into me. I am then taking Dave's Skype stream and blending it into the OBS stream that I'm putting out to YouTube. Um, all my computer is also controlling my mount and just to make life interesting, uh, this is a new mount that I only purchased about 10 days ago and it's not being trouble free at the moment. So my mount has crashed twice tonight already. Um, and then just to make it all interesting as well, I have to then send my desktop image back to Dave in real time because if he views the um, the YouTube stream, it's about 10 seconds delayed. And of course, if you're talking about saying that's 10 seconds delayed, you get extremely confused. So he's actually seeing my real time feed going back to him. So the, that's kind of an example of the all the pieces that have to hang together here for this to continue to work throughout our presentation. So anyway, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to my slide presentation. I'm just going to run through a few slides to give you an introduction of what's going on. So uh, first of all, where am I located? Well, I kind of mentioned that. I'm actually in uh, Scripps Ranch. If you look, um, you see the gray area. There's two gray areas. If you if you go north of the uh, higher gray area, 
um, and you go up about halfway, there's a small city called Poway, and I'm located uh, pretty close to the city of Poway, uh, basically in borderlight skies. So we, we suffer a lot from light pollution here. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I do AAA is because it's a great way of counteracting uh, light pollution. Um, the camera setup that we're using tonight is a little different to what I've done on live streams, uh, just to add um, um, some more interest and spice to whether we can actually keep this live stream going for the entire period. Um, because not only is I'm, am I using my regular setup, but I'm also using a guide scope tonight. And the reason I'm using a guide scope is because we're actually going to be doing some longer exposures of some of these targets to pull out some more detail. And because my um, my uh, C8 um, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope um, has a relatively long focal length, even with the focal reducer on it, um, uh, we need I need to use guiding in order to um, keep the telescope pointing at the target so that the target doesn't sort of blur and smear. Um, so I have a guide scope uh, located um, above my main scope. Um, and behind the main scope, as I mentioned, there's a focal reducer. Behind that, there's a uh, filter, a set of filters, um, and I've got a light pollution filter in at the moment to try and knock down a little bit of the light pollution that we get from the city of San Diego. And then uh, connected to that is a, a nine megapixel uh, camera with a square format. And that's all now sitting on a new mount for me. This is a, a Skywatcher. Uh, EQ6R. Um, those of you familiar um, will know that I've uh, typically used an AVX and uh, while the EQ6R um, is definitely a massive step up in terms of performance, uh, it's also a, a big step up in terms of the problems I'm having with it at the moment and um, currently it, it's kind of disconnecting itself occasionally which <laughs> is, a, is a bit of a problem. That's the list of all the software and uh, hardware that's running this evening. I won't go through it, um, but it's there just for your information. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to look at the deep sky objects in Orion from the perspective of Robert Burnham Jr. Um, and particularly from what, it, what a book he wrote called Burnham's Celestial Handbook, An Observer's Guide to the Universe Beyond the Solar System. This is a, a quite an old book. In fact, it's been out of print now for many years. You can only buy it on the secondhand market. But Dave and I are huge fans of Robert Burnham, and I'm sure many others of you as well are probably big fans as well. And Robert Burnham was kind of an interesting character. Um, uh, kind of described in people that wrote about him, particularly Tony Ortega, as a bundle of contradictions. Um, he was a recluse. He was socially awkward. He was brilliant and dedicated at what he did. He worked for the Lowell uh, Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona for 22 years, um, doing a, um, a survey, survey work for them. And while he was doing this survey work, he made, he did a lot of uh, his own observing and the notes from his own observing became the Celestial Handbook that he initially self-published because uh, he couldn't get a publisher. And then it was picked up by Dover Publications. And we're going to be observing Orion primarily this evening, um, the constellation of Orion. Uh, it's rising at the moment. Orion is... Um, really signifies the onset of winter and it is very much a constellation that many people um, look up into the night sky. It's one of the few, few constellations that most people recognize. Uh, you can usually see the belt of Orion. Orion was uh, Orion the hunter. You can see the belt, the shoulders, the feet and the sword of Orion. And there are actually some fainter stars that make up the uh, Orion constellation, which are actually his bow and also a raised arm um, but typically most people recognize Orion just by the shoulders the belt the feet and the sword and uh, we are going to be looking um, around Orion um, and 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 basically looking at it through the eyes of Robert Burnham this evening and why Orion well one 
it um, signifies winter. It's very much a winter constellation. And secondly, um, and I didn't actually realize this, but it, it sits in the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex, which is a huge uh, and, and vast area of nebulosities, uh, nebulosity um, star growth birth areas, um, and this graphic that we've got up on the screen kind of shows it. Um, I picked it up off of one of the websites and it shows you the many, many different areas of nebulosity that are uh, in the constellation of Orion. And it's those that we're primarily going to be concentrating on this evening. There's some interesting stuff in uh, Burnham's notes regarding the constellation and many of the stars. Uh, for some reason, he went into great detail regarding the history of uh, the name uh, of Orion and the mythology surrounding Orion. Um, went back into many different cultures, uh, different kinds of names, and shows the, the language history, the translation history. Uh, there's a great read in Burnham's books regarding the, uh, the, der the, the derivation of the name of the constellation and the stars. And it's, uh, I mean, it would take me an hour to read this to you uh, so you need to read it for yourself. It's very enlightening. Right. So this, I believe, is where we try and start the viewing part of the evening. And uh, what you are now seeing on the uh, screen is a image that I've been taking 40 second uh, exposures with. I've now stacked 21 frames, so about 15 minutes of uh, image. And we are looking at the open cluster which is just north of the three stars that form the sword of Orion. And this is the open cluster NGC 1981, um, which was discovered by uh, John Herschel in uh, 1827. Uh, it's about 28 arc minutes across, um, which, as you can see, kind of nicely fills the field of view of my telescope, which is um, pretty much um, 30 arc minutes. Uh, it's 0 0.5 degrees. And uh, interestingly enough, not only can we see the open cluster, uh, but we can also start to see some of the nebulosity now that the Orion uh, constellation is famous for. Um, and you can see several, uh, uh, you can see large areas of nebulosity uh, here to the left hand side. And you can actually see a really interesting structure uh, right on the corner of the image here, which is uh, three star, uh, bright stars. Um, that also appear to be uh, formed a reflection nebula as well. Um, so this image now has been formed for quite some period of time. Um, of course, I managed to uh, forget to change my target name. So when I save it, I'm going to uh, get the wrong name. Uh, but I am going to uh, save it. And we are then going to move on to uh, probably the most famous uh, nebula uh, in the um Orion constellation and that is the Orion nebula itself and because this is just such a bright nebula I'm actually going to bring I'm actually going to clear that stack again there we go um, I'm actually going to bring my um, sub time down to about 15 seconds because uh, I can collect a lot of data and we can see our first image uh, pretty quickly here we go so um yeah, so uh, I will adjust this in a few moments uh, to uh, make this a little cleaner. Um, but before I do that, in fact, let me do that quick adjustment here as we allow a few images to come in. So the Orion Nebula M42, um, and I'm going to be reading directly from um, Burnham here. Th this is the great nebula in Orion, considered the, the finest example of a diffuse nebula in the sky and one of the most wonderfully beautiful objects of the heavens. And in fact, I think um, you can see this is a pretty incredible uh, image that we have formed here, um, probably with only um, we 60 seconds of imaging. Um, and you can already see uh, the core area showing bright white. 
um, and the expanding Orion Nebula. Now, the Orion Nebula is considerably bigger than the um, field of view of my telescope. So we're actually uh, really only seeing um, the first part of it. Uh, if I actually wanted to uh, show this image in its entirety, I would probably have to put a mosaic together. Um, but um, obviously, we're not going to do that this evening. So again, to quote, uh, to quote Burnham, it may be seen in a pair of field glasses as a faint haze spreading out from the famous quadruple star theta in the middle of the Sword of Orion. So when you look at the Sword of Orion in the sky, you will see three stars in a line. Well, the middle of those three stars, theta, is actually a collection, a quadruple star. And in fact, it's even, it, it, in fact, it's even five, five or six stars, but it's, it's generally known um, by the four brightest stars for the, um, called the trapezium. Um, so this is effectively the middle star in the Sword of Orion. Um, in a small telescope, it appears as a bright green mist enveloping the star. Now, what you often find is that when you're doing visual observing, because of the way that your eye receives light, you tend to see things pretty much in black and white um, or with a slight greenish tint so you tend to miss the colors that we're seeing on this uh, the, the screen this evening um, because actually the the Orion Nebula is a, a vast collection of reds and purples and whites. From Burnham's book he made a, a note here that M42 uh, was the first nebula to be successfully photographed by Henry Draper in 1880. Uh, using an 11 inch refractor, and his exposure time was 51 minutes. So uh, at this point, uh, they did not know what nebulas were. And, uh, but this one was the first one actually uh, successfully photographed. It is not surprising since it is one of the probably, I wouldn't say easiest objects to photograph in the sky because it has an extremely high. Uh, dynamic range um, and in fact we're going to do some more imaging in a couple of minutes that will actually show the core um, and typically when you see uh, a picture of M42 as we're seeing at the moment it's pretty much in this format um, where the core is completely blown out because the dynamic range of the uh, target that we're looking at is so high so this area here we cannot see the four stars that provide the light basically light up uh, this reflection nebula and uh, this this area here is known as m42 this area here which is slightly separated is known as m43 so we're actually seeing uh, two Messier objects here as as classified by um, uh, Charles Messier m42 and m43 and m43 is actually lit up uh, by the central star. You'll also see some very dark areas here and what you will see throughout the Orion Nebula or, or throughout the entire Orion region is that you will see a lot of dark nebula and these are very thick dust clouds that are in fact in front of um, the nebula that we see behind and they actually block the light and from the nebula and from stars um, from coming through it. And so you see these channels that you know, almost appear to be uh, cut into the nebula itself. But in fact, it's actually an object in the foreground that's stopping light coming through. Burnham went on to say, um, in a moderately large telescope, its appearance is impressive beyond words and draws exclamations of delight and astonishment from all that view it. The great glowing irregular cloud shining by the gleaming light of the diamond-like stars entangled in it makes a marvellous spectacle, which is unequaled anywhere else in the sky. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, certainly viewing from the Northern Hemisphere, um, the Orion Nebula is without doubt uh, probably uh, the most impressive nebula that we have available to us. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the parameters of my capture. So the first thing I'm going to do is save that image. And I'm now going to look at 
the trapezium, uh, which is the four stars in the bright area here. And in order to do that, I'm basically going to drop my exposure time down to about a second. And I'm going to restart my stack. And I'm going to let this capture some fast images. So now I basically come down from about 15 seconds to about one second. So we've come down, what's that, about five f-stops, if you were thinking about this from a photographic perspective. Um, and that allows me to uh, obviously look in detail now at the, uh, the central part, which was blown out in our previous image. And of course, we've lost now the uh, detail surrounding it. So we're, gonna, uh, we're going to zoom in. We can quite clearly see now the four stars that make up what's called the trapezium and again to quote Burnham I am going to here we go so Burnham says this is probably the best known multiple star in the sky and one of the most interesting for the small telescope the four bright components form a little quadrangle called the trapezium and the object is favorite amongst all observers he goes on to say the trapezium is the bright core of a compact cluster of faint stars which may form an expanding association within five degrees of the trapezium there are more than 300 stars brighter than magnitude 17 a study of this group has been made by K.A. Strand, he finds some evidence for the expansion rate, which would indicate an age of no more than 300,000 years, and this makes it one of the very youngest star clusters known. The conclusion also appears to be verified by the color magnitude diagram of the group, which is very similar to the diagrams of other young star clusters, such as NGC 2264. These star groups, the fainter members, have not reached the main sequence state and may still be contracting gravitationally. So what we're actually seeing here is we're really looking at a area where stars are forming. Um, and this the whole Orion Nebula is an area where the, the gas and the dust that we're seeing is actually, um, actually giving birth to uh, new stars on an ongoing basis. For visual observers um, with a large scope and a good sky, the trapezium uh, not only has those four stars, but it has at least two, it's actually three, that uh, can be seen by large scopes. In my 16-inch dub, I have seen uh, the E and the F stars uh, for a total of six stars in a, in a trapezium. I'm um, sure it's possible to photograph it, uh, but you would have to reconfigure your system to uh, be specific for that, you know, for that object. But there are many stars there. And like you said, I think there's, um, I think Burnham said 300 stars um, brighter than mag magnitude 17, I think is what he said, in that general area. So yes, it's a very active star forming region. And um, it is a, a wonderful object to, uh, to examine. Okay, so um, we've done a couple of nice images now of the M um, of of M42. I am going to save that because I don't think I've actually got that image so far. Um, and I am now going to move on to NGC 1977. Um, right, so let me just try and get my head in order here. Let me stop my guiding. Um, let me um, slew my scope. So now I'm actually going to uh, pick my guide star for this uh, latest acquisition and I'm going to start my guiding off again and as you can see uh, the previous guiding there was actually going extremely well um, it's kind of interesting this this scope appears to go through periods where the guiding 
gets extremely good and then there are periods when the guiding seems to go all over the place so um i think this is still very much a learning process and uh i i've got to figure out um um perhaps some more optimal parameters because uh, literally i i switched phd on ran the calibration once and kind of expected it to run uh, which it is doing but probably not as as well as i would like it to um and we're going to move on to our ne next target which is ngc well we're already there 1977 i am going to increase my exposure time and i think this time i'm going to run at a full 60 seconds of exposure uh this you would not be able to do uh if you were um if you were not guiding uh it would just be asking the tracking on the on the scope to be doing too much um, and you would start to see elongated stars but by guiding it keeps the stars nice and circular so uh, let me reset my stack and we are collecting our first image of NGC 1977 which is the nebula that sits again just north of m42 and m43 and this is known as shapeless uh, 279 uh, it's a hydrogen uh, alpha region um, and um, i can see that our target has come straight up in the screen here with our first 60 second capture so we're going to let a couple of these capture and then I'm going to adjust it um, and it's got a very uh, famous name that uh, hopefully uh, you will be able to see uh, in in a few moments um, and so I am going to bring my histograms in here we go we're beginning to form a We'll let that image form a little bit more here um, and um, this is nebulosity that surrounds the star 42 Orionis um, and is about half a degree north of the main mass of the Orion nebula and in um, in uh, Burnham Celestial Guide there is uh, on page 1336 a, a picture from the 42 inch reflective uh, uh, reflector uh, scope at Lowell of this nebula and we're seeing pretty much this picture in fact um, I would say the quality of the picture that you're actually seeing on the broadcast is significantly better than the one in the book uh, that is actually showing some elongation of stars so clearly there were some some tracking issues going on but hopefully now um, you will perhaps be able to guess if you don't already know uh, what the name of this particular nebula is more uh, colloquially known as uh, it's called the running man nebula um, and uh, we have our man here uh, the bottom is actually down here so his head is here his arms are here and his legs are here and you can see uh, this nebula <coughs> kind of makes this rather nice picture of this man uh, running which is where it's picked up his name and you'll find that the name of many of the nebulas the sort of colloquial name uh, is very much determined by you know the shape what people see in it you, you know you know Gary I think many of the people in our audience might not understand the the term nebula and how we're using it sure basically a nebula is just a cloud of gas in the sky and um, but there are three basic types of nebulas, and these pictures here, uh, the Running Man and M42, uh, demonstrate uh, those kinds very well. So one type of nebula is uh, what we call a reflection nebula, where it's basically a cloud of gas, which is uh, uh, bombarded by ionized particles and light from a bright young star. So the bright star uh, energizes this, uh, this gas, and um, what it does is it reflects the light, just like uh, smoke in a room when you turn on a light bulb. 
And so that's a, a reflection nebula, which is just basically reflecting the light from the star. Then you have emission nebulas, which uh, the ionized flow from the star actually causes um, uh, chemical and electrical reactions within the star and makes it fluoresce, or it's more like a, um, a fluorescent tube or a neon type, type sign where an electric charge causes the gas to actually glow. And so that is what we call an emission nebula because it's actually creating a light uh, because of the energy being bombarded from, from the star. The third type of common nebula is uh, a dark nebula, which basically, and Gary mentioned it in a uh, discussion of M42, it is a cloud of gas that is between something bright and where we are. So that cloud of gas blocks the light from, from whatever is behind it, and it looks like a dark shadow. So basically, uh, that is not reflecting or, or fluorescing any light. It's just blocking the light from behind it. So the three basic kinds of nebulas we see when we talk about nebulosity in the sky are uh, uh, nebulas that reflect light from a nearby star, uh, nebulas that are bombarded by high energy and they create their own light and they're emitting light, emission nebula, and then the dark nebula which blocks the light uh, from whatever is behind it. And what's kind of cool, Dave, is that uh, wherever you look in the constellation of Orion is you're, you're kind of almost, in fact, seeing uh, often in your view, the three types of nebula that you've just mentioned, right? We have dark nebula here, uh, quite clearly showing up uh, below the running man. We have emission nebula, and we also have, uh, you can see the reflection nebula here. So um, I think often you are seeing uh, in, in, in these images, uh, either two or three types of nebula in, in sort of one go. You get, you, you get a, a big bang for the buck in the Orion Nebula or the Orion Constellation, I should say. So I'm going to save that now. We're now going to move on to our next target, which is called B33, um, albeit that once again, this has a colloquial name, which is, um, is um, far more descriptive of the actual target. So, um, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to stick with 60 second imaging. Um, I am going to switch my guiding off for a second so that I can move my scope. Okay, so I've just moved my moved my scope. And where we're actually going now, so now we've moved from the sword and we're now going to the belt. And if you were looking at the Orion constellation, uh, this uh, is close to the lower of the three stars in the belt of the uh, constellation of Orion. Um, that's the kind of area that we've moved into. Um, and we're going to take a couple of images in this particular area. Right, so I'm um, going to start my looping again on my guide scope. I am going to uh, select a guide star. So my uh, scope is uh, hopefully going to start guiding here shortly. Looks like we're away. Um, I am now going to go and change my name here to B33. I'm going to clear my stack. And uh, we're going to grab our first 60 second image of uh, this nebula. And here we are straight away. Um, and our first image here um, is actually pretty good. Um, and uh, perhaps, uh, well, I'm, I know many of you who are actually on the stream already know this, um, but this is the, uh, is colloquially known as the Horsehead Nebula. Um, this being a dark nebula um, in the shape of a uh, horse's head. 
Um, and so uh, Burnham said, this is the famed dark horsehead nebula, undoubtedly the best known example of a dark nebula in the entire heavens. It is almost completely invisible to the eye at the telescope and requires long exposure photographs to reveal its strange and spectacular details. Now, interestingly enough, um, when Burnham wrote this book, which was back in the late 60s, that may well have been the truth. Um, but as you can see here, with a fairly modest telescope, um, within a 60 second exposure, we've actually managed to create you know, a pretty reasonable image. And now as we grab a few more frames here, hopefully we will be able to improve that. Um, this is located about half a degree south of the bright star Zeta Orionis in a long stretch of nebulosity IC434, which extends for about a degree south of the star. This nebulosity was probably first detected by Pickering on photographs made in 1889. And the dark horse set itself clearly shows clearly on a plate made in 1900 and published in the Astrophysical Journal in 1903. The significance of the object was not immediately recognized and the early descriptions refer to it as a bay or gap in the nebulosity. Bernard Bernard seems to have been the first to recognize it as a great obscuring mass of some sort seen against the bright region of nebulosity behind it. And uh, we have our, hopefully our second, yeah, we've now got three images in for about 180, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, three minutes. Of you know, uh, Gary is going to say, um, Burnham also says, claims that um, the, the visual observer, not using a camera, uh, it might be possible to get a hint of, of this outline of the nebula uh, with a fairly large scope under a very pristine sky. And if you have a good trained eye, according to Burnham, he says that a good 8 inch or 10 inch uh, telescope uh, with a wide field eyepiece might actually uh, display the outline of, of this shadow. Although I have attempted to view the horse head with my 16 inch job and have not yet been successful, maybe because um, I'm not in good pristine skies. But um, it is interesting that he's claimed that it, it, it can be done. You know, one of the things that Dave and I often do when we're, um, you know, or, or we were doing last year, I would say, uh, certainly not in 2020 with the pandemic, um, is uh, we will often run the 16-inch uh, dob next to uh, my EAA setup. Um, and I remember when I first started, uh, we started doing comparisons of the images that we could see both visually and with EAA. Um, and it is an, it is interesting to, um, you know, be able to do that and see um, some of the things that you, you know, show really well visually. I mean, globular star clusters, for instance, are, are some of the things that show extremely well visually. Um, they show well in EAA as well, but because of star bloat and stuff like that, you don't get the impression of it there being so many stars. Um, you know, you can see hundreds of stars for sure, but you can't see the thousands that you can see if you're doing it visually. Whereas something like um, the horse head, for instance, I mean, this is a classic example of something that um, shows extremely well with an EAA setup but is uh, perhaps somewhat more difficult to view visually. And again, this is kind of a nice image. Uh, we can now see the horse head. And if, if, if you allow this to develop with more time, you will actually start to see some filaments in the actual horse head itself. It's not a solid uh, mass. Um, there are some filaments that begin to form. And again, we've also got a nice example here of a uh, you know, another type of nebula showing up. We've got our dark nebula, we've got a reflection nebula. And uh, this this must be an emission nebula, right, Dave? The red area here. So we're basically uh, seeing all three types. Uh, I, would I would think so. so. Generally, the emission area, emission nebulas have a lot of the uh, hydrogen alpha frequency at uh, 626.28 um, nanometers, and that's that red color. So uh, yeah, it's, it's more than likely, in, you know, an emission nebula. Yeah, so we're so we're really seeing 
um, you know, all three types of nebula in a single shot here. So I'm going to save that image. Um, I think we probably, and that's only eight minutes of imaging here. The guys who are doing the astrophotography, if you look at um, images of the Horsehead Nebula, some of them will have been collecting three, four, five, six hours of data to put their images together. So you can imagine the level of detail that those guys are able to achieve. But I think for six minutes, which is practically real time, um, you know, we've we've done a really good job of seeing what is actually uh, relatively relatively difficult target. And we're now literally going to push the scope um, just a few arc seconds away from the horse head. We're going to move up the nebula. We're going to basically move in this direction. We're going to go up the lane of this nebulosity and we're going to go along, if you could imagine the nebula spreading out here, it then turns and goes up in this direction and we're going to we're going to go up here and we're going to image this area over here so that's that's going to be our next target so i'm going to go into phd i'm going to switch my guiding off again i'm going to initiate my slew which literally is already done i'm going to pick up my guides another guide star Right. So uh, we are now moving on to, uh, like I said, we've just kind of moved along the nebula. We've turned the corner and uh, we are now looking at another pretty spectacular, or we will be in a couple of minutes, looking at another area, a pretty spectacular uh, nebulosity, which again, it uh, tends to get photographed on a fairly wide scale basis. Here we go, uh, our first 60 second image, and mm. uh, we have um, a pretty good first rendition of what's known as the Flame Nebula. Um, and we also have the uh, we also have the lower star in this field of view of the belt of Orion, and that would be which. Which star, Dave? Just remind me. Uh, all, all on attack. attack. On attack. Thank you. And so you can see the lower of the three stars in the belt of Orion, and next to that you can see the flame nebula, um, and that's already beginning to form. Uh, just off that first image uh, was a pretty nice. Um, pretty nice image so we're going to collect a few images here and let and uh, just adjust this a little bit so that we can uh, we can uh, get the best image we can uh, Gary, I'd, I'd like, like to make, make a, a uh, shout out here to sure. uh, a fellow SDA member and good friend of mine Carl Weber uh, I happen to have an image that Carl made of the flame and the horsehead region it's absolutely gorgeous, um, printed on sort of a metallic plate in a beautiful color. And the image is interesting because he managed to remove the stars. And um, all the tack is gone. And all the tack is a very bright star, uh, but he managed to remove the stars and just show all that nebulosity in the horse head and the flame. And it makes a wonderful piece of art. So uh, shout out to Carl Weber, a good friend, who does a lot of uh, astro imaging. Thank you, Carl. Yes, and if we actually, um, the other night when we were sort of setting up for this and, um, and trying to get our ducks in a row for this live stream, uh, Dave was actually able to share his screen with me and then I was able to put it onto the live stream. Um, but I'm certainly not going to try that this evening because it could be the, the one <laughs> straw that breaks the camel's back here. I'm surprised actually that we're still running, to be perfectly honest, considering <laughs> the problems that we were having earlier. My, my five-year-old, who will be six in January, is a big fan of Orion and she was very much like daddy daddy can I come out and join the um the beginning of the the thing this evening but I was having so many problems that I had to say to my wife that you know please take her in bed and take her to bed because I just can't cope with um you know another 
set of issues here. So uh, she was a little upset with me, but I'll make it up to her tomorrow or something. We'll probably do a little bit more imaging if the if the weather is uh, is decent. Um, so again, I'm pretty pleased with that. That's not uh, that's quite a nice uh, image of the flame nebula there. Uh, again, you can see this really um, distinct area of dark nebulosity um, that not only uh, runs up the center here, but also these um, tributaries that run across. Um, and this makes this a pretty spectacular image. And uh, it it kind of looks nice here with the with the um, Almatac um, just forming in the bottom image here. So again, I'm kind of quite pleased with that as uh, an image. And we're going to move on to our next target, which is a Messier target. Uh, so let me just stop that. And uh, this is going to be, a... yeah, it's going to be M78. So let me... Let me just slew the scope. Again, we're not moving very far here. We're just slowly moving our way up the... Uh, we're kind of moving our way uh, from the feet to the shoulders um, as we as we do this. And part of the reason that we're doing that is because the feet now are probably disappearing between uh, behind uh, several high fir trees that I have in the garden here. Um, I have an extremely limited field of view um, from my garden and literally uh, we will, well, Orion will disappear at some point. So you can, uh, um, we can only be live streaming for so long because Orion will just not stay uh, anywhere I can see it for very long. Um, right, so um, I am looping i need to auto select a star okay set my guiding going again and i am going to go into here this is m78 and again i'm going to run this at a 60 second exposure and this is actually one of the more difficult targets in the Orion constellation, even though it's a Messier object, um, I've, I've not been really getting fantastic images of it so far. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it comes out this evening. So while we're waiting for that first image to form, uh, I will just say that uh, M78, and again, this is in the words of, of Burnham, is a bright diffuse uh, nebula located about 2.3 degrees northeast from Zeta, Orionis and uh, virtually on the celestial equator. It was discovered in 1780 by P. McCain, who described it as two fairly bright nuclei surrounded by nebulosity. Messier, who observed it later in the same year, thought it to be a cluster of stars with much nebulosity. Admiral Smythe saw two stars in a very wispy nebula in which Lord Ross thought to find some indication of spiral structure. Um, and so these were the early, um, the, some of those names there are some of the well-known and famous uh, astronomers of the late 1800s. Um, of course, we're all doing visual astronomy um, and um, sketched um, what they saw and often used quite colorful language to uh, describe it. So M78 is one of the brightest portions of the vast nebulosity that covers much of Orion and which becomes visible in the presence of hot early type stars. Easily located with small telescopes, this object shows very little detail to the visual observer. The two bright stars enclosed within the cloud are about 53 uh, arc seconds apart. And the nebulosity itself rather sharply bordered on the northwest side, melting away into the sky background towards the southeast. In the, for a space of about half a degree around the nebula, the sky is heavily obscured by an absor absorbing cloud which in which scarcely a star shows. And I believe we will, we will see that. So here is M78. And... Um, here um, we can see the 
two stars that we talked about a few seconds ago and I think also you can see this region here uh, which is uh, the, the dark obscuring area that we also mentioned and then further away uh, we have another area of uh, nebulosity in this area and this kind of I guess a little bit reminiscent Dave of um, is it the Cancun Nebula that also has the nebula kind of shows up in the middle and then there's a very distinct donut of uh, dark nebula that surrounds it? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but, but this, this one, one is great, great because um, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great, great example of that, of that dark nebula obscuring, obscuring uh, the outer portion. It's, it's kind of nice. nice. Yes, yeah. Um, and actually this image is forming reasonably well. So let me just do a few adjustments. It's kind of interesting to me, Dave, how this, uh, um, I guess, became a Messier object. I mean, it's not, it's nowhere near as spectacular as many Messier objects, although I guess size-wise it is certainly comparable with many of the globular clusters and everything you see. So um, perhaps that's the reason. Um, the other thing, too, is it was discovered by Pierre Machin. And uh, Pierre Machin, of course, was... Uh, uh, Messier's psychic, and uh, Messier then observes it later on and ends up in his list. I suspect that there was some, maybe some uh, competition uh, between Messier and Machine regarding finding an enemy's objects. It's sort of an interesting uh, dynamic that appears to go on there. Yes, and um, um, yeah, maybe that's uh, the reason that this uh, particular uh, object did find its way into the Messier catalogue. So I think we're almost coming to the end. I've got w one or two more targets, I think, in the um, in the uh, observing list here. I'm going to save this one. Um, my PC's just gone crazy. Oh, oh, good. Um, well, that worked out. The timing <laughs> on that worked out spectacularly well because um apparently i just got a message that came up on the screen to tell me my telescope has just disconnected again so um maybe this is uh the place to to finish so um um hopefully everybody's had a fun evening um it's definitely gone a little better than i anticipated um as we struggled to get all the kit up and running as i said um if you didn't hear at the beginning of the street, I'm actually located in one physical location. Dave's located in another physical location. He's Skyping into me. I'm sending a screen share back to him so that he can see my real time view. Um, all because we're trying to get around the COVID restrictions here in Southern California. Um, but it's been fun. It's definitely been a learning exercise for us again as we try and take our uh, outreach program, um, uh, you know, and uh, and optimize it for online viewing. I I think that uh, I'm hoping that uh, whoever is still out there uh, has found this uh, whole process somewhat entertaining. Um, we really enjoy doing something which is as close to being live and hands on as we can possibly get uh, with the given restrictions. So. Uh, it would be much, much easier for, for Gary and I to produce an entire show and record it and then post it up on YouTube and send a link to you so you can see it. But it would not have the same impact as uh, knowing that you're actually there participating with all of these uh, uh, weird uh, technology problems and these challenges that we have. Uh, it just makes me feel like I'm a little bit closer to the actual um, hands on, uh, you know, eyepiece and the scope, uh, talking to the kids, stepping up on the ladder kind of outreach, which we've we have been doing for so many years with the San Diego Astronomy Association. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm I hope that you feel that this is entertaining and that it's at least somewhat informative. Um, I certainly welcome any comments from anyone out there regarding uh, problems you've noticed or things you would like to see. Uh, you can reach me at outreach at sdaa.org. Uh, there's a link on the website. Uh, you go to uh, uh, our website, and uh, on the left-hand side, 
uh, you'll find the links for all of the major officers, including myself, under the outreach program. So let us know what you think, um, and I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Uh, Gary and I were a little frustrated at about uh, 7.45 tonight when things were not going well, but uh, now that it's after 10 o'clock, I've had a wonderful time myself. And Gary, thank you so much for some very, very great images um, that we've been able to put together uh, with this uh, cobbled together system. So uh, thanks again, Gary, for that work. And we thank all of you out there for participating and um, uh, keep an eye on our website and our calendars. Uh, we hope to continue doing a few more of these and uh, hopefully we will get better as we go along. So thank you very much, and Gary, back to you. Okay, Dave, great. And so I will just say uh, goodbye to everybody. Um, as Dave mentioned, we have a web page. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Just search for San Diego Astronomy Association, and obviously uh, this video is been hosted on the San Diego Astronomy Association YouTube channel. Uh, I have my own personal YouTube channel as well, where you can find another uh, a whole series of EAA events there as well. So anyway, uh, good night, everybody, and uh, look forward to catching up with you again.